Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. According to the rule of the Lucan genealogy, the recent coronation of the English king was uncanny in its egregious assault on the biblical proclamation of the resurrection. On the one hand, those who have stayed with this podcast over the years have hopefully come to understand that scripture is a system of cancellation encoded in literary form. It is a divine story given to undermine everything wrought by the hand of humans, shutting down all that we say and do. We want scriptural wisdom to be pro-human, but it's satirical. It makes fun of us and criticizes us. We want to make the case that it does so for our sake, but it won't let us. Instead, it insists upon its rule for the sake of the entire creation, of which we humans are but a small part. In the teaching of the resurrection, following the line of Isaiah, only God's instruction is allowed to stand out upon the earth. No human being least of all a king may stand out, hence the crucifixion of Jesus. With this in mind, if you are trying to avoid transgressing St. Paul's teaching of the Antichrist, let me give you some helpful advice. Don't make yourself stand out above all others on international screens with costly pomp and flair. Whatever you do, Don't invite your subjects to swear fealty to you. Don't publish articles defending meaningless pageantry. Likewise, don't write a book complaining that you don't stand out. Don't do it. Don't. Don't do it. And for God's sake, if you have to be coronated, please do it quietly and not during the Paschal season when we are warned repeatedly that there is only one whom the Father has anointed to stand out upon the earth. And he shall come again with glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom shall have no end. Richard and I discuss the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, verse 27. You're listening to the Bible as literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 481 of the Bible as Literature podcast. You have heard in the past on this program or our companion project, Tarazi Tuesday's discussion about the critical role of Cyrus in the storyline of the Bible. Why is it? Why is it? It's one of those strange biblical novelties. Why would God choose this king in the prophecy of Isaiah to rescue his people from the Babylonians? Now, in the rise of Scripture, Father Paul explains what is happening in the historical setting. And we're not going to spend time on that in today's episode. You can go back and listen to Tarazi Tuesdays, or better yet, pick up a copy of the rise of Scripture and make the effort to understand what's happening in the broader storyline of Scripture. But with respect to the Lucan genealogy, It's interesting that the names that we hear today, 
in verse 27 of chapter 3, not only crisscross with names that we hear in the Mathean genealogy, but they're names that crisscross with the reign of Cyrus in the scriptural storyline, which makes functional Isaiah's teaching of God's intervention in chapter 44 of Isaiah for the sake of Israel through his locum tenens, Cyrus. So Luke is telling us a story and now he's bringing to mind the proclamation in the story of Isaiah of God's use of a foreign king. So once again, in each generation, God is making an attempt to save his people from the tyranny of human oppression. And now Luke is making this special attempt from Isaiah present for us in the story, and hopefully through our discussion of the meaning of the names, not just in verse 27, but as this Lucan genealogy unfolds for us, Rich, we might be able to uncover what Luke is saying about Cyrus. As I've mentioned many times before, Luke could have just copied the genealogy from Matthew, but decided not to. In this verse, we have two names that coincide for the first time so far, besides Joseph himself, with the genealogy in Matthew. That's odd. Why these two names? Why these two people? Why these two monarchs? And they are precisely the ones who benefited from Cyrus coming in and allowing the Israelites to return to their land. I mean, Cyrus was, in a way, the old school or, or old fashioned kind of imperial leader who just said, you know what? All the nations can live where they want. They can worship whatever God they want. That's not my business. We'll let the Israelites go back to the land. They can build a temple. We'll even give them money to fund their own temple. That's what the Persians were allowing the Israelites to do. And so the Babylonians who brought them into slavery now, Cyrus is the one who defeated the Babylonians, because he was Persian, in order to allow the Israelites to go back. For some reason, and I think it's significant, this is where we have an overlap between these. So why is this important? It's important because, like you said, Father, the Lord in the story made something more complicated than it had to be. Why couldn't we just have a plain old good versus evil story, where, like, the poor Israelites brought into Babylon, Babylonians mean, Israelites good, Israelites rise up against the oppressor, defeat the Babylonians, and then walk back to the land on their own. We don't have that story. For some reason, God had to make it more complicated and say, you know what, I'm going to bring in another Gentile leader who's going to defeat the other Gentile leader, and they're going to fight it out. So the Israelites actually don't get to decide when things are done. I'm not going to do the Moses thing again. I'm just going to bring in a total Gentile. He's going to have the people go back to the land. We're not going to do like Moses and Moses comes in and tries to convince the people and stuff. No, we're just going to have a new ruler come in and just send them all back. That's it. They have to cross the desert. Isaiah talks about how they're going to get across the desert, but Cyrus doesn't really seem to care. You're going back. And that's it. That's enough. And Cyrus then ends up being the one who follows the will of God, at least for the time being. You know, I don't need to repeat how many times we have stated our lack of trust in these leaders. You know, Cyrus, his line goes awry on its own, and we don't have to worry about that. But in this, we have these two Israelite leaders who benefit from this. But what's significant is that they don't actually make the call when it's time to go back. They're not the ones who rise up against Babylon. They're the ones who just happen to benefit from this Gentile king who happens to be kind to them and is anointed by God to be the one to do so. Just listen to these verses from Isaiah. I'm not going to read the whole section, but I want our listeners who should go back and obviously read Isaiah, as I often say, at least a thousand times. But <laughs> for the purposes of today's episode, I'm just going to read these few verses. I'll start with verse 28 of Isaiah chapter 44. It is I who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he will carry out all my desire. And he says of Jerusalem, she will be built, 
and of the temple your foundation will be laid this is what the lord says to cyrus his anointed again god is talking about a persian king to cyrus his anointed whom i have taken by the right hand to subdue nations before him one could almost imagine the rulers of israel being jealous licking their wounds why isn't god lifting us up the way europe is lifting up zelensky with all due respect that's not how isaiah works to undo the weapons belt on the waist of kings to open doors before him so that the gates will not be shut i will go before you and make the rough places smooth i will shatter the doors of bronze and cut through their iron bars i will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden wealth of secret places so that you may know that it is i the lord god of israel who calls you by your name for the sake of jacob my servant and israel my chosen one i have also called you by your name i have given you a title of honor though you have not known me it moves of course into chapter 45 i read through verse 4 and there's that theme in isaiah the paschal theme as we have come to understand it much later the way it was co-opted in the new testament that only the lord stands out in the resurrection that's what christ is risen means it means that everyone else is flattened and only the instruction of isaiah stands out on the landscape and it's painful that the king that is used to make the instruction stand out is not a son of israel that is a painful teaching here the question that we have to address is why is luke making that teaching functional in his genealogy that a foreign king is the king that god is using to make you get the message that you are flattened in the judgment and only his teaching stands out on the landscape and all the kings are wiped out and you are among the kings that are wiped out and yet you are honored by this teaching that's a heck of a message rich we have perfectly good Israelite kings who could be running the show here. But for some reason, the Lord keeps going to the outside and picking the outsider and doing something peculiar. The Lord just keeps doing it. And it's, I mean, ever since Genesis 2, oh, you want a companion? How about one of these animals? No, 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 I want someone like me, Adam's response. So God wants to say, hey, what about the horses? What about the cows? They could be your companion. Yeah, but I don't really like... I prefer to just have one like me. Then he creates woman. Why does God have to keep doing the complicated thing? Why can't he just make Jesus the Messiah the way everybody wanted? Why did he have to make a Messiah the way he wanted? Why did Jesus show the Lord's glory so strange? Why did he have to do it that way? God keeps doing things the complicated way and the weird way. And this happens over and over again. And we have to be ready for that. Once we try to put God in a box, he's going to say, yeah, I don't like the box. Here's what's going on outside the box. Every time. Every time you have to look outside that box. That's what we've been saying since the beginning of this. All right, we want a successor to the Hasmoneans. Let me do Herod. Herod's just like everybody else. He's your inside the box guy. That's what you get. You want inside the box, you get Herod. You want outside the box, you get Jesus. Yeah, but we don't like either. Yeah, I'm sorry. You're either inside the box or you're outside of the box. We don't like Herod. He's too mean. We don't like Jesus. He's too wimpy. How about just me? Could I just be the king? Yeah, I mean, that, that's the only option, right? You know, Luke is going to present Theophilus with a new way of thinking because otherwise you just end up with another Herod after another Herod. And how much different is Herod from Pharaoh? Not a lot. How different from the Babylonian rulers or the Assyrian rulers? No, Alexander, no, the same. It's just the same every time. The son of Yohanan, the son of Risa, the son of Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, the son of Neri. These names are a bit easier to unpack. We talked about this, Richard. The one that jumps out of me immediately is Risa because it's close etymologically to the Arabic Rais. Father Paul talked about this on his own podcast. It means head. In modern standard Arabic, it's the word that's commonly used for president. It's also used in the liturgy 
to refer to the head of the church, it means the head, the archi, and it's used similarly in Hebrew. It's not unpacked that way in the standard Bible dictionaries, which is why it's important to spend some time and do the work yourself and make an effort. When you look at Bible dictionaries, especially with the Lucan genealogy, they all cheat. They just say, an ancestor of Jesus. That's why you have to make the effort to do the research yourself. And you either have to know languages or know people who know languages and spend some time with the text. That's why they don't talk about the Lucan genealogy in church school, Rich. Yeah, if you do it in Sunday school, it's going to be pretty boring. So-and-so, the son of so-and-so, the son of so-and-so, the son of so-and-so, and there's no other reference to them in the Bible, and we don't know anything about them other than they're in the Lucan genealogy, right? But yeah, when you begin to unpack them and you start to translate them, you have Yahweh has been gracious, Yohanan from Hanan, which means grace. And this is the same as John. These are a little bit easier than some of the previous verses because they're more standard names and they appear elsewhere. Yeah. Some of these have been pretty obscure, but for whatever reason, verse 27 is a bit easier. Yeah. And, and he says, you said, you know, in Hebrew, it's Rosh, which is head, you know, and strangely, we have two different sons of Zerubbabel. So like I said, we have Zerubbabel in both Matthew and in Luke in the genealogy, but the son here that we're interested in talking about is Risa as opposed to Abiud in Matthew. So that's kind of where they go differently or whatever. So, you know, this whole idea that this is a genealogy of Mary as opposed to Joseph, it actually is not super helpful because it does overlap with Saltiel and Zerubbabel, but the ancestors of Zerubbabel and Saltiel are also different. So how we get that far is different. So that actually doesn't help. That explanation, this is of Mary and not of Joseph. You could say that. I don't believe it because it's not mentioned in the text, but it doesn't explain why the predecessors to Zerubbabel and Saltiel, who would be a common ancestor, those ancestors are completely different. That idea that this is a genealogy of Mary and not of Joseph only explains half of what we've done up to this point, but we're going to see that from this point, it's not any clearer. Getting back to the names, Zerubbabel is the seed of Babylon. We talked about him when we talked about Matthew, and he actually is mentioned as a king. Thank goodness we have actually a connection here. Ezra 2.2 2 and Nehemiah 7.7, 7, they talk about Zerubbabel. So that one, your Bible dictionary can actually guide you someplace to talk about this other than just an ancestor. My initial reaction when I saw Neri, the term that jumped into my mind is nar in Arabic, which means fire. It turns out that in Hebrew, the term is lamp, my lamp, because the yod at the end is the possessive. So Neri is my lamp. Yeah, it's a very logical connection and they would be connected. And here we can't ignore that we had a guy back in 25, which is my illuminator. So we have this idea of light appearing elsewhere. So it is definitely not a stretch to connect these. And we also have this as a name elsewhere. The uncle of Saul and the father of Abner, the one who betrayed David, his name is Nair. And that's in 1 Samuel 14, 50, and 51 as an example where he talks about Saul's uncle Nair. And also Neriah, which is either the Lord is light or the light of the Lord, is the father of Baruch, who's the scribe in Jeremiah 32. So we have this connection, both the one who betrayed David, but also the scribe in Jeremiah, which, if you want to say Jeremiah was faithful to the king, I don't know, <laughs> because the king didn't seem to think that Jeremiah was faithful to him. This faithfulness to the king is actually ambiguous, because on the one hand, disloyalty is not good. On the other hand, betraying king for the sake of the word of the Lord, you're faithful to the word of the Lord. Like, that's the reference point. If the word of the Lord makes you disloyal to the king— then you're being loyal to the word. If you're disobeying the word and disloyal to the king, then you're disobeying the word. The king is not the reference. The word is the reference. So therefore, the scribe is the reference. The scribe, insofar as he adheres to this word and passes on this word, it's an honorable way to continue this word. The fact that we connect through this name, my lamp, we have the lamp of the Lord in 
Jeremiah, and we have the betrayer of David in 1 Samuel. We have this attempt, again, remember this is always the attempt that the Lord is trying to give to the people so that they have a chance of following their rulers and having faithful, loyal rulers to the word. So we have the one who is the lamp, the one who I asked God, that's Shaltiel, the seed of Babylon that comes now is implanted in the land, and then we have the head and the grace from the Lord. This is the progression that we see through here. We know where it's going to end up, even though the Lord keeps giving this chance, giving a lamp, giving grace, giving what was asked for, offering a head, offering this seed, the human beings are always going to betray it. And it's always going to end up the same way. It ends in judgment. We said this last week. It ends in judgment. The arc of the universe bends toward judgment. Okay. Let's just accept that. It's God's justice, which in Isaiah is not good news. It is good news, but not on human terms. And that's what Isaiah 44 and Isaiah 45 is preaching in the anointing of Cyrus. So what strikes me about this verse, Richard, is that it's giving hope to the addressee of the genealogy that even though this is all ending in judgment, crucifixion and the coming judgment, it's good news because in the end, the only one who's going to stand out on the landscape is God. So it's kind of a glimpse of where this is headed. So if you hear this in the context of the teaching of Cyrus and Isaiah. If you hear all of these names, I'm going to read the verse again, and I want you to hear it the way someone who is fluent in Hebrew, someone who would hear the names functionally, would hear this verse. The Son of the Lord is gracious, the Son of the Head, the Son of the Seed of Babylon, the Son of I Asked Elohim, the Son of my Lamp. Imagine hearing it that way natively and being so familiar with the story that you would say, oh, this is in the context of the reign of Cyrus, the Lord's anointed, who was sent to free God's people and who smashed all of these kings upon the earth so that only God's teaching would stand out. So that in the end, everyone would know that only God is the king. Now, I want to caution everyone, we have to hear the rest of the genealogy. But at the same time, we can cheat a bit because this isn't our first rodeo. This isn't the first time Richard and I have heard scripture or heard the Gospel of Luke. It's the first time we've paid close attention on this level to the Lucan genealogy. But scripture is scripture is scripture. At the same time, there's more for us to learn from the genealogy because it's a very complicated and nuanced passage. But we have some familiarity with what's going on here. And it's a beautiful verse and a hopeful verse. People may say it sounds crazy to have hope in the scriptural version of Pascha, which is the announcement of judgment. But the scriptural proclamation of Pascha, in which everything is flattened but the Lord's commandment, that's what it means to say Christ is risen. It means that nothing matters but the teaching of the gospel. It's the only thing that stands out on the horizon. Everything else is condemned. That is the teaching of 1 Corinthians. That is not what people celebrate on Easter, but that is what 1 Corinthians teaches which is a regurgitation of the teaching of Isaiah, which apparently is what Luke is saying here. That is hopeful, even though it's difficult to hear. People don't want to hear that. They might not accept it, but who cares? Because our hope is in the Lord. I was just teaching Hebrews 11 recently, and there were a couple of people who were kind of frustrated because it was all about how all these presbyteri, the elders, as Scripture calls them throughout the Bible, throughout the Scriptures, were faithful because they trusted in the promise. But you can't just believe in the promise. That's not enough. 
you're faithful in what you're commanded because you believe in the promise. They wanted just the promise. They didn't want the commandment. When you take the commandment seriously, Hebrews is scary. When you take out the commandment, Hebrews is fantastic because we just wait around until the promise happens. <laughs> it's really awesome. Sounds like modern Christianity. I was talking to modern Christians, so that's no coincidence. Obedience is truly the measure. The fact that Christ is risen is because he was the one who was faithful. So all the people who believe, who trust in the promise, Christ's resurrection is manifestation of that trust. It's the manifestation of the things hoped for, as Hebrews puts it. But for those who are obedient, and for those who end up on the cross, this is the promise. That's what's very difficult about this passage, because it promises kings and promises kings and promises kings, and the measure of judgment is always the same. Are you obedient? We have the person who is declared son right before this genealogy, who will be the obedient one by the end of the story. But then that only functions for us as we hear in Hebrews 10, so that we exhort one another to love and good works. Christ is risen. Indeed he is risen. Take care, Rich. Thank you, Father. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School.